There are headaches and then there are migraines. If you've ever had the latter, you know it's not just a bad version of the former. And as common as they are, millions of people get them. What causes migraines and how to treat them remains stubbornly elusive. Here with the most current thinking on this neurological condition, we welcome in Montreal, Quebec, Dr. Elizabeth Leroux, neurologist, president of the Canadian Headache Society and the chair of Migraine Canada. And in Mississauga, Ontario, Dr. Marissa Lagman, director of the Pediatric and Adolescent Headache Program at Women's College Hospital. She's also with the Division of Neurology at the Hospital for Sick Children, and we are delighted to have you two with us tonight uh, for a program that, um, well, let's put it this way. If you suffered from migraines before, this pandemic's not doing anything for your sunny disposition. And let me go, just go through some of the numbers here uh, before we chat. Uh, Tony, thank you for bringing this graphic up here, and I'll read this out for those who are only listening on podcast. 25% of women experience migraines, only 8% of men and 10% of children. So women are disproportionately suffering from this condition. Fully a third say migraines limited their job opportunities. A little over a third of those employed missed at least one day of work in the past three months due to migraines. Now that stat of course goes back pre-pandemic, pre-pandemic rather. And the vast majority of people with migraines experience depression as well. Uh, Dr. LaRue, start us off here. What exactly is going on in the brain to make migraines happen? What a good question. So people have to understand there's a heavy stigma on migraine because in the past it was said to be psychosomatic, to be psychological, to be some weakness of the personality. And nothing can be more wrong because now we have very strong science demonstrated my, my, that migraine is a brain disorder. Um, it's caused by a bunch of genes probably that interact and make the brain like with a particular software. So during the migraine attack, there are electrical and chemical events in the brain leading to the pain that is typical, but also to all the other symptoms of migraine, light sensitivity, uh, sound sensitivity, nausea, vomiting, dizziness, brain fog, aura. There's so much going on in that brain, um, but at least now we understand it a bit better. So my message is really, it's a brain disorder and we know at least a little bit what is happening. Dr. Lagman, how do you know if yeah. you're suffering from A, a headache, B, a really bad headache, or C, a full-blown migraine? So in our world of headache medicine world, there are a lot of, uh, we have a framework that we actually follow to say if it's a headache, if the headache is a migraine or not, because there are 200 types of headache disorders in our, we call it the headache Bible. So um, a regular headache is probably more of the most common type is attention headache. But if it's a migraine, the headache is mostly moderate to severe and it's associated with symptoms like nausea, vomiting, and sensitivity to light and sound. And it's, they're quite uh, disabling because they get worse when you're uh, physically moving. And they are usually on one side of the head uh, majority of them in adults, but in children, they can be on both sides and they're pounding in quality. Now, if you get a migraine or if you suffer from mm -hmm. migraines, it, it, can it be the kind of thing where, you know, it's just a once off or maybe you get it twice a year, or is this the kind of thing that is persistent all the time? So um, I always tell this to my patients, migraine is a lifetime disorder. Uh, the good thing is that if you're a male, uh, I have little kids, little boys who had migraine, but usually their migraines get better when they're around their teens or their 20s. But in female, majority of the time they get worse because of hormonal changes. And usually when we treat the migraines for this patients, we tell them that the goal is not to be headache free, but we can make them better. And now usually we usually tell them that the goal is usually having less than four days in a month because studies have shown that if you're having four or more headache days in a month, that will actually put you at risk of having progression of your migraine to a chronic migraine stage. Hmm. And Dr. LaRue, those numbers we gave off the top are really quite disquieting if you're female. Do you know why women so much more uh, disproportionately suffer from this than men? Well, the easy answer to that is hormones, right? So during the fertile period of the women, there are fluctuations of hormones. And uh, the drop in estrogen that uh, women get with their uh, period is a very strong trigger for migraine. So some women will actually suffer with uh, what we call menstrual migraine, which is 
a migraine attack that is always linked to the period. Um, but there, there are many women who will have this, this attack and then also other attacks. There's, so there's other things about the female brain uh, in the pain networks, for example, and the role of estrogen also plays uh, in other zones of the brain. So there are many things that we still do not understand exactly. But I, I want to really tell women out there that things can be done. But also, let's not forget the males, because 10% of men or 8%, 8 10% have migraines. And I've seen a fair amount of males that are not diagnosed because people just think it's just a women's disease. Uh, so it's very important not to forget about the men suffering from migraine. Well, appreciate that. But uh, it, it, tell me, I think you touched on this in your first answer, but maybe we can flesh it out a bit here. Genetics, the role of genetics in migraines. What is that? So our brain is like, think of the brain like a computer that has a special software. And the brain is filled with neurons and blood vessels and, uh, and tissue. And all those, this is kind of a big symphony of proteins acting together, neurotransmitters. And all of this is encoded by genes. So many people, when they think about the gene, they say, oh, that one gene caused that disease. That's what we call a monogenic disease. So the one gene, one disease. Migraine is most likely a combination of multiple genes that interact together to cause the diverse things that we see with migraine. Because you can have, as Dr. Lagman alluded to, you can have two migraines per year, or you can have migraine every day of your life. So just the severity is variable, the symptoms are variable, the triggers are variable, and that may depend on your personal particular set of genes. And some people will say, oh, my whole family has migraines, no wonder I have them. But others, they say, nobody, I'm the chosen one. You know, I'm the poor only person with migraine. So these people might just have a combination of genes, of genes that led to their migraine attack. And those genes are known to play in the pain networks, in the neurons, but also in the blood vessels. So it's a combination of factors. Dr. Lagman, I suspect mm -hmm. those watching right now, if they have not suffered from a migraine or don't know anybody who has, we really need to explain to them how debilitating this can be. Um, are, are we talking about, I mean, can't get out of bed, just completely, anyway, you fill in the blanks, you tell me, what, when people get them, what does it feel like? So actually the World Health Organization uh, uh, published in 2017 that it's the second most disabling disorder in the world, and it's the third most pre prevalent disorder in the world. So in patients who have migraine, some patients will have a very bad migraine. We call that a red headache, where in they're in bed, they can't do anything. But there are some episodes of migraine where in they're more of moderate, that they, they can still function. The problem with this is that if a patient has frequent, very, very frequent headaches, sometimes they power through them. So even if they're suffering, they are, can actually still work, but they're not 100% in their work. We call that presenteeism, and majority of them can miss their work. And some of them, I have a lot of patients who are in, they have to be on disability because of their um, migraine. But the problem here is that in, here in Canada, it's not uh, considered as a disabling disease. So we don't have a code for a disabling, uh, that it's one of the disabilities that they, they actually approve when you apply for disability. And let me ask you a kind of a COVID related question in as much mm -hmm. as we're seeing that uh, children experience COVID-19 much less significantly than the rest of the yeah. general population. Is it mm -hmm. the same for migraines? So uh, yes and no, but uh, they actually can start early on. So in, female, in males, for example, in boys, they can start as early as seven years of age and up to 10. And then in girls, they actually start around maybe 12 to 13 years of age, which is around when they start having their period. Uh, it's relatively common in, in, in children. Actually, some uh, the in uh, they start around seven years of age, one third of them. All migraineurs, they start at seven years of age, and then 50, more than 50% of them start by 15, mainly, mainly, mainly because of the hormonal changes. The, the problem with this is that most of them are underdiagnosed. They feel that they only have normal headaches. So they don't treat them as migraine because they think they are normal headaches or sometimes they're thinking, oh, they're just making excuses. They don't want to go to school, which is so bad for them because studies have shown that if you do not treat the headaches as early as when they're younger, then they progress to very bad migraines or more chronic migraines wherein they have to be treated with so many medications. 
I see. Well, we'll talk treatment in a few minutes, but first of all, I, I, I suspect a lot of people have seen this clip, but on the chance some people are watching who have not, we want to play this. This is a CBS reporter. Uh, this thing went viral, and um, oh. well, they're trying to report from the Grammys, and let's see what happens. Well, a very, very heavy, uh, heavy divertation tonight. We had a very Daris, Darison bite. Let's go to Terrace Chase and for the bit. They have the pet. Now that that's scary. That is absolutely scary. And uh, Dr. Rue, I think people at the time probably thought uh, th this poor reporter is having a stroke. Um, um, you know, is that the normal result of a migraine? So let's let's describe what this journalist has and, and show she has speeching difficulties. Uh, so, we, so in this case, we knew in, from analysis later that what she was experiencing was a, a type of aura. So an aura is a, an electrical phenomenon. It's a wave of electricity on the brain. And where the wave goes, well, depends on the symptoms. Usually an aura is a visual phenomenon. And I invite people watching us, you can just Google and look at images for migraine aura. You'll see lots of images of how it can look like zigzaggy lines, flashes of light, colors, kaleidoscopes, and so on. So that's the most common type of aura. And approximately 25% of people with migraine will have auras at different frequencies. But the majority of people with migraine do not have auras. So Auras can be visual, but in the case of this journalist, um, they, the wave went to the zone of speech, and that's why she was struggling. And in very severe cases, um, especially with genetic disorders, actually, we, we have auras where people may even paralyze. We call those hemiplegic auras, and those are strongly associated with particular genes. So that you can really appreciate the vast spectrum of migraine as, as with or without aura, what type of aura. Uh, and that can be extremely scary. Can you imagine having that? You know, if you're traveling with your family and suddenly you cannot speak or you cannot see or you can't move. Um, so this is something that can be extremely disabling. And that's that's part of the spectrum of migraine. Well, at the risk of projecting here, I think it would be even more terrifying to happen on live TV. And you could see that she was in trouble. And and uh, mm -hmm. what what would have brought that on at that moment? Any idea? So the triggers where we're entering the world of triggers of migraine, but uh, triggers can be multiple. Anything that puts a charge on the brain, because the brain is an electrical thing and it, it's, it's a chemical organ. So whatever puts a burden or a charge on it can actually trigger a migraine. So it can be dehydration, stress, uh, fasting, certain foods. In the case of visual aura, many of my patients report that flashy lights uh, or strong lights can actually trigger them. Exercise, exhaustion. Um, so that it's, it's, there's a vast array of things. So in the case of this reporter, maybe she has been under stress. Maybe there were strong lights flashed to her, uh, her face. Um, maybe she'd been fasting, who knows? So often triggers accumulate and then lead to the, uh, to the attack. Understood. And Dr. Lang, yeah, go ahead. Yeah. Can I add more that in, in children, there's a big study done on triggers for migraine in children. I just want to emphasize this because number one is sleep followed by warm climate and lack of sleep. That's why I almost always tell my patients that sleep is very important. Stress management is very important uh, because cognitive behavior therapy has shown very promising help, uh, more of like evidence that it helps with migraine prevention. And the other big thing that I want all children, all parents to remember is that video games screens, computer exposure, that actually is one of the more common triggers for migraine. That's why mm. we limit ex uh, screen exposure. That's part of our teaching or education, part of our, um, at Women's, for example, at Women's College Hospital, we do teaching before I see the patient. Even before they see me, we have a one hour to two hour of teaching, one-to-one uh, -one that we're doing right now with our nurse, uh, teaching them how to avoid triggers because that's the one of the best treatment for migraine is to avoid what triggers them. And we teach them how to do a diary to actually identify what the trig their triggers are. Dr. LaRue, let's do a little uh, truth or fiction here. Uh, one hears that um, a change in the weather, maybe a change in the barometric pressure uh, can bring on a migraine. True or false? It's true for a subgroup of people. And there are many people who actually believe that the weather is influencing them and they're overestimating it. I know people are going to hate me for this saying that, but let's say true for some people. Okay. How about things like red wine or chocolate? Uh, overindulging in that. Can that bring on a migraine? Alcohol is one of the strongest and most potent triggers for a migraine attack. Uh, it may depend. Some people say it's red wine or, or white alcohol. Who cares? But alcohol is a very strong trigger. 
chocolate overestimated. There's actually a study uh, demonstrating that if you give people blindly something with chocolate versus uh, another neutral product that looks like it, it doesn't trigger them. So often people deprive themselves from different foods. People pay a lot of attention to foods and it's okay to do that. But um, uh, you, you have to remember that food is just one part of the equation. I really appreciate what Dr. Lagman was saying, that sleep, exercise, uh, managing your energy, pacing, all of those things are sometimes underestimated and people just focus on diet, which can be a good thing, but they forget about fasting and hydration. So, um, so chocolate, not necessarily the stronger trigger. Fasting and being dehydrated, very important. Hmm. Dr. Um, Lagman, in, in yeah. terms of what you would like to know about this condition, here's what you do know. Here's what you'd like to know. How close together are those two things? Uh, so what you need to know is that migraine, we're still doing a lot of studies on like getting some of the markers for the migraine so we can have targeted uh, treatment for migraine. Um, but what you need to know about them, we do a lot of education, but at the same time, we also tell them that uh, there's a lot more for the past three to five years. What we know is that it is a brain disorder and there are some genes, there are some imaging studies done to actually tell us that it's definitely a brain disorder. Um, and there are some evidence that it could be a, a, a a dysfunction of the uh, part of we, a brain called recal brainstem or the hypothalamus, right? So, and there's a lot of studies now that are uh, focusing more on what happens before a migraine. So we can target that. Uh, for example, what Dr. LaRue has mentioned about chocolate. Actually, sometimes it's not a trigger, but it's actually a prodromal symptom or premonitory symptom because craving for chocolate is actually a sign that you will develop a migraine. Now, Dr. LaRue, I don't want to put words in your mouth here, but it is not unknown in the medical world for afflictions th that disproportionately affect women to be less studied, less researched, and it feels as if there's sort of less emphasis put on trying to find a cure as opposed to things where the preponderance of victims are male. Would you say that's going on here? Yes, I would. Um, I think the stigma of migraine is based in, you know, human beings have been having migraines since probably millennia. Uh, it's part of our brains. Um, but one of the key reasons why migraines are so stigmatized is that we do not have a biomarker, a visible proof of the migraine attack. So in science, we do have proof, but you know, you cannot order a CT scan, you, you won't see it. You cannot order an EEG, you won't see it. So the lack of a biomarker just leads people to imagine that that it's, it's, it doesn't exist. And then you add that it's a disorder of women, and then you can build all this personality thing about, oh, this woman is whiny, she's anxious, she's troubled, she's never happy. So all of this has built the migraine stigma, and I really think we should start destroying the stigma and help those people because, I mean, they're suffering. So the stigma adds to actually being sick. So if you have multiple sclerosis, which is by the way also a disease of women or breast cancer, there's no such stigma. It, we have progressed. But with migraine, we're still stuck in that kind of old style way of thinking that it's just a disorder of whiny women. We sh really should go past that now that the, st the science is helping us. Good. Well, thank you for putting that on the record. And let's now spend our remaining time talking about what can be done about this. And I guess I want to break it up into... Um, medication, um, talk therapy, uh, change of diet. Um, Dr. Lagman, why don't you get us started on that? What are people thinking in your line of work about how to treat this thing? So our first line of treatment is to educate patients. So using the headache diary, um, making sure that they avoid their triggers and identifying their triggers about sleep, hydration. Those are very, very important. We have done a study on that, that it decreased the emergency room visits of patients by more than 50% by just doing education. So that's our non-medication part of treatment that we call the non-pharmacologic treatment. And then for medications, we divide them into more of rescue medications. I have a headache now, get rid of them now. So that will include the Advil, the Tylenol. We use triptans. Uh, we use anti-inflammatory medications for that. So 
uh, our, our main emphasis on that is I have a headache now. Please treat this as early as you can, because if you do not treat it early as you can, then the, medica the medications will not work anymore. And then those are other part of the treatment are the prevention medications. So this are the medications that we use that they have the, med uh, the patient has to take daily to one, to decrease the frequency of their headaches, to shorten their headaches, and also to make their headaches less disabling for them. So, and, but they're not going to take those medications for a very, very long time because once the headaches are better, then we can actually slowly taper them off. The big part of the other treatment is cognitive behavior therapy. We actually provide uh, our patients, we have uh, uh, our headache psychiatrist at Women's College Hospital who actually lead a CBT group for all our migraine patients who actually will need that. So it's CBT or cognitive behavior therapy for pain. And then we also do mindfulness therapy as a group. And then we also teach a lot of our patients to take use apps for mindfulness. Uh, for relaxation. So I, I teach all my pediatric patients how to do that with their parents. Hmm. Dr. LaRue, what about things like make sure you go to bed at the same time every night or make sure you have dinner at the same hour every night or as much as is possible? Does that help? So yes, the migraine brain does not like sudden changes. Um, so I want just to reinforce on what Dr. Lagman said. So there's really three things. There's er everything that's behavioral, you know, your lifestyle, your habit, how you deal with your brain, how you use your brain. Then there's the meds, the, we we'll call it the abortives or the acute medications, and then preventive approaches that can be medications or now also neurostimulation devices. So in the vast world of education, um, the thing is there's no, there's no absolute rule. So you cannot just say people do all this and then it's going to help your migraines, you're gonna be cured. That's not true. But it always helps to adopt a migraine-friendly lifestyle, which is sleeping enough, uh, being hydrated, avoid fasting, uh, exercise generally well. Um, but sometimes the hard truth is some people do all that. They live like, you know, in a, in a perfect, pristine, crystal clear way of life, and they are still disabled by migraine. So it's, we have to strike this fine balance between just putting all of migraine on the, the, the lifestyle, uh, when it is actually sometimes a disorder that requires medication, just like asthma, by the way. So asthma, sometimes you get rid of the cat, you're good. But other people with asthma will require a lot of medications to get, uh, to get good control. So um, once again, we have the spectrum idea. And some people, for, for some of them, different lifestyle habits will help. But from others, it's not going to make a big difference. Stopping caffeine, for example, we, we recommend to everyone to stop caffeine. But some of them do that, and it doesn't change a thing. So, uh, so it can be bewildering for patients to make very important choices about their lives. But at some point, when you start, you know, missing parties, stopping seeing, like missing days of work, having severe attacks, being bedridden, and you do all you can, it's time for medical therapy. I mean, you you, you will you will need some medical therapy, and that may be over the long time. And I, I maybe I disagree a bit with Dr. Lagman that we can stop the drugs because in adult world, sometimes medical therapy is, is needed over the long time. We'll have yeah. to continue that debate next time because we're plumb out of time this time. Uh, but I want to thank both of you for coming on. This was absolutely uh, extraordinarily helpful uh, for those who are suffering from this and for those of us who don't and want to know more about it. So Elizabeth LaRue and Marissa Lagman, thank you both so much for coming on to TVO tonight. Thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you very much. The Agenda with Steve Pakin is brought to you by the Chartered Professional Accountants of Ontario. CPA Ontario is a regulator, an educator, a thought leader, and an advocate. We protect the public. We advance our profession. We guide our CPAs. We are CPA Ontario. And by viewers like you. Thank you.